Hallelujah. Praise the living God. It's another day that the Lord has made. We celebrate Jesus. We thank God for Jesus. We give God praise for Jesus. The Bible said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should have not perish, but have everlasting life. We're thankful to God for another wonderful day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. Friends, welcome to our online program, Early Will I Seek You, Life Devotionals of the Bible Academy. Let's celebrate God and worship him and the beauty of holiness. You reign. You ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your king. Hallelujah, God. You reign, you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Almighty God, you reign, you ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Blessed Holy One, we worship you, God. We adore your holy name. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Ancient of days, we worship you, Lily of the Valley, we adore you, bright as the morning star, we glorify your name. The Bible says you are the one who was, who is, and who is to come. He said, your going forth is from of old and your name is called holy. That's why we kadosh you. We worship you. We, we bring your holiness to bear in our worship. The Bible said we should worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We bless your name. This morning, sweet Holy Ghost, think through my mind. Speak, Lord, through my lips of clay. Grant unto me, as well as your people online today, the spirit of wisdom. Grant us revelation in your knowledge. Let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. Help us to know the hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, the exceeding greatness of your power, Lord, that has worked towards us who believe. According to the workings of your mighty power, which you wrought in the body of Christ Jesus, Lord, when you raised him from the dead and set him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and dominion and might, and every name that is named, Lord, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Father God, you have put all things under the feet of Jesus. You have made Christ Jesus to be the head over all things for the benefit of your church, which is your body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We've been talking about God's covenant, how that God has proposed to relate to people on the platform of his covenant. What is covenant? It's a pact, it's an agreement, it's an alliance, it's an understanding. It's a relational walk with God through intimacy, especially in the context of the New Testament. It began with God's idea. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. You see, the covenant of grace in Christ Jesus was not initiated by man, but was introduced by God to solve man's problem. God's idea of covenant is not just only to relate to mankind, but to bring solution to human problem. And over time, since the beginning of Adam, there has been introduction of covenants with different people. Hence, we're talking about increasing in God's covenant. God that we serve is a revelatory God, number one, is a progressive God, number two. 
is an ever increasing God. Number three, when I said increasing, it doesn't mean that God himself increases because he cannot. He's in the highest. The Bible calls him the most high. But it's ever increasing his relationship with people. The word increasing can also mean that God is ever improving his relationship with people. And one of the ways that God increases and improves his covenant relationship with mankind is by giving us a progressive revelation of who he is. That's why individuals that walk with Jesus cannot sit on the earth and imagine that they are okay. When you stop growing, you start dying. You can't just rest on your back and say, well, I'm full with God, I'm already there. No, you can't be there. There's what is called ever-increasing faith. There's also called what is ever-increasing in God's covenant. God wants you to increase in his covenant. That's why all through the Old Testament, God reveals himself to different people in different ways to show an ever-increasing approach of his covenant. In Genesis chapter 1, God introduced to us what the Bible scholars describe as the Adamic covenant. Adamic covenant was what God, covenant that God made with Adam by giving him dominion over everything that he has created. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible said, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the creeping things that creep on the earth, the animals that walk on the earth. The Bible said God gave man five mandates in that Adamic covenant. Number one, the Bible said God said to him, be fruitful. Two, multiply. Three, replenish the earth. Four, and have five, have dominion. Let's just read Genesis chapter one. Five mandates of God's covenant. Five mandates of God's covenant, and it's it's a progressive experience for Adam that as God ordained for him, he should increase, he should improve. In the Adamic covenant, we see the mandate of increase. And so it is in every other covenant that God has created for mankind, ever increasing approach to the covenant of the almighty God. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be reading from verse 26, very, very phenomenal, so that we can appreciate how God expects us to increase in the covenant. Genesis chapter 1, I read from verse 26, reading from the King James Version, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful. That's the first increase in the Adamic covenant. Be fruitful. Number two, multiply. Number three, replenish. The word replenish means to refill the earth. Number four, subdue. That's the one we were looking for. Subdue it. God expects us to subdue, to put on that. I imagine that the word subdue already suggests an enemy in the Garden of Eden. I imagine that when God said to Adam to subdue, it means that there will be a resistant force against you. you see, some people have said that maybe God did not want Adam concerning the serpent in the garden. Well, I believe that when God says subdue, it means that to put under. Now, you don't put under and just want anything that is not resisting you. The idea of subduing suggests war, suggests an opposing force, suggests a resisting force. So God said, put that resisting force under. And once you have subdued, then gain dominion over it. Friends, the truth is that you cannot have dominion without subduing. And that's what Jesus told us in the New Testament when he said, this authority I have given to you to bind serpents and scorpions. In the book of Luke chapter 10, verse 19, when Jesus sent disciples out and they returned 
in the power of his name, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us in your name. He said, you that give unto you authority, power. Power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. The idea of subdue in the book of Genesis chapter 1 kind of relates to what Jesus gave to his disciples in Luke chapter 10 in verse 19 when he says you can have authority, you can have dominion, you can tread upon serpents and scorpions. We know that there is a serpent in the garden when God told Adam to subdue. And as he said to Adam in the Old Testament, God has given us this fivefold mandate in the covenant. Yes, Adam fell and lost out in the covenant, but we also have the privilege of God's grace in the New Testament. As Jesus himself is called the last Adam, and this mandate in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 is yet given to us in Christ Jesus in the new covenant of grace in Christ, who is also the last or the second Adam, we also can have, number one, fruitfulness. That's the first step in the covenant of God. God wants us to be fruitful. In the book of Deuteronomy 28, God said the key to our fruitfulness is obedience. Is obedience. While grace initiated fruitfulness, Obedience brings increase in our fruitfulness. It said, if you were acting diligently to the commandment of the Lord your God, that you will be fruitful. You would increase in fruitfulness. Let's quickly see the book of Deuteronomy 28, a command and a decree of blessing for obedient children of God. Deuteronomy 28 says, and it shall come to pass if you were acting diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. Obedience to God brings us to a point of increase in our covenant work and covenant relationship with God. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you if you will hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Increasing in the covenant also brings the increase of God's covenant upon our lives. There are some increases that come into our life because we are in a covenant relationship with God. In verse 3, it says, Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the field, verse 4, blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the fruit of your ground. That's fruitfulness, friends. Fruitfulness on all sides. The, you shall be fruitful of you, in your cattle, the increase of your kind, and the flocks of your sheep. So you see how God connects fruitfulness with increase in verse 4. Blessed shall be thy basket and your store. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. And the Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessings upon you in your storehouses and in all that you set your hand unto. And it shall bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. God will cause you to increase because you are in a covenant relationship with him. That's why Genesis chapter 1 verse 20 tells us how increase can happen to us. Number one, we can be fruitful. Number two, we can multiply. Number three, we can replenish. Number four, we can subdue. And number four, we can have dominion. Grace introduces us into the covenant of God in the New Testament. But our obedience attracts the blessing of the covenant. Now let's look at what is also called in the Bible Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is not just a covenant of relationship with God, it's also a covenant of increase. When God introduced a covenant with Abraham, he told him, walk before me and be perfect, meaning adhere to what I tell you. Listen to my instruction. Don't just do things your way. Don't be sentimental in this covenant. 
be obedient. Don't get emotional in this covenant. Just have faith and be obedient. Hallelujah. Now, the Abrahamic covenant actually started with God calling Abraham out of idolatry. Bible history and Bible scholars explain that the place where Abraham hailed from was a land of idolatry. It was a nation or a country of multiple gods. Bible scholars explain that even Abraham's father, Terah, had not less than 12 strange gods that he worshipped. Hence God told him, I am Jehovah. I'm introducing myself to you, Abraham, and I am the only one you should serve. God is one. The Bible said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. When God introduced himself to Abraham, he was calling him out of multiple gods to worshiping the one and only true God. Genesis chapter 3. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. Now that's a covenant of God, what is called Abrahamic covenant, going by a call to come out. In the New Testament, we also see something happen to this. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord. He said, touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a God of thee. So God said to Abraham, come out, get out of your kindred, get out of your country, get out of your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a nation. Friends, listen to me. In the covenant of God, it doesn't just come with promises. It also comes with instruction. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that reproof of instruction is the way of peace. So even though God promised Abraham that he would bless him, that blessing or the blessing are predicated on his obedience. What obedience? Come out. If Abraham insisted on staying in Mesopotamia or of the child, this he will miss the blessing that God promised him. So, how do we explain the covenant of God in Abraham or with Abraham as it is called the Abrahamic covenant? It is a covenant that requires obedience and faith, or the obedience of faith, meaning that you obey God because you trust Him. There are many times God will give us instructions as believers in the New Testament. It may not make sense to us humanly. But because we know that God has spoken, we don't go by common sense. We go by what we call the sense of faith. The Bible said in Romans chapter 4, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And when did Abraham start believing God? When God told him to come out of his father's house, to come out of his comfort zone, to come out of his familiar territory and go to an unfamiliar zone, yet promised to be very good land by God. The Bible tells us, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 years old when he departed out of here, and Abraham took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in here, and and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Into the land of Canaan, they came. Obedience. Come and say obedience. Obedience. Very important. In the Abrahamic covenant, we see the increase in the life of Abraham. Abraham became very great. Abraham became very blessed. Abraham became a covenantly enriched person. In the same Genesis chapter 12, we see the progressive growth of Abraham, how it continues to increase in the covenant of God. I mean, there came a time when God increased Abraham so much and he began to think, God, you have blessed us so much, but we grow childless. What do we do with this inheritance? My servants are going to inherit them. My name will die. I will no longer be Remember, and God said, no, I'm going to yet increase you, Abraham. I'm going to give you and your wife a son. 
Let's read Genesis chapter 15. After this, then the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And verse 2, and Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is the Eleazar of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir. That means the one who will inherit your properties. But he shall come forth out of thy own bowels, or he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And God brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall your seed be. Verse 6, and he believed in the Lord. Abraham believed in the Lord, and God counted it to him for righteousness, increasing in the covenant of God. Also means increasing through your covenant with God. There's another covenant that we like to refer to in the Bible. It's called the Noahic Covenant. The Noahic Covenant is an interesting covenant because it was a covenant of faith and yet obedience. Something similar to the Abrahamic Covenant. We also understand from Bible's genealogy and chronology that the Noahic Covenant preceded the Abrahamic Covenant. In Genesis chapter 8, God commanded Noah, actually from chapter 7, God commanded Noah to go and build him an ark. And after building the ark, to go into the ark. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, in Genesis chapter 6, God's word came to Noah. Asking him to build an ark when it had not rained in the land for many years. It didn't make any sense again. Listen to me, friends. Operating and increasing in the covenant of God requires faith. If you have to go by the norms, by your common sense, by what is normal, you cannot walk or increase through God's covenant. Why would God ask a man to build an ark as a protection from a coming flood? Not just small, you know, showers of rain, but heavy downpour of rain, a flood as it were. But the Bible said, Noah obeyed God. Noah did according to all that God commanded him. Hallelujah. Let's read the book of Genesis. Chapter 6, in verse 13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence to them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make you an ark of gopher wood, room shall you make them in the ark, and shall pitch it with, within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which you shall make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. If you read down the line, you will read verse 22. Just did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So he did. In the Noah covenant, if Noah had faith in the instruction of God and he obeyed God, it's called again the obedience of faith, increasing in God's covenant. Very important. That to increase in God's covenant, you must have faith in the God of the covenant and be willing to obey him. Faith in the person of the Almighty God. Faith in the promises of the Almighty God. Faith in the provisions of the Almighty God. Faith in the plans and purposes of the Almighty God and faith in the patterns of the Almighty God. The word pattern also brings us to another covenant which the Bible describes as the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant that God made with Moses, particularly on behalf of the people of Israel. 
God spoke to Moses to go to Pharaoh and told him to let his people go. Now, don't forget again, it didn't make human sense for Moses to go back to Egypt and confront Pharaoh. It didn't make sense. Why? Because this same Moses had fled from Pharaoh. Because this Pharaoh in their clan had planned and plotted to kill Moses. Why? Because Moses, in his zeal as a younger person, had killed an Egyptian because he perceived God was sending him as a deliverer. Now, somebody said, if you appear before your time, you would disappear. I assume that Moses appeared before his time. Even though anointed, his appointment was yet to come in time. The Bible said the vision is for an appointed time. Though he tarries to wait for it. Now Moses didn't wait for his appointment. Hence he went ahead to kill an Egyptian because he was oppressing an Israelite. Where Pharaoh had how Moses had killed an Egyptian, threatened to kill him. And the Bible records that Moses fled Egypt when God is a good God. All things work together for good to them that love him, to them that are called according to his purpose. I believe that Moses was called according to God's purpose. God used the, that those period of, of fleeing to prepare Moses for the right time. While Moses was with Jethro, some believers believe that God took Moses through what they call the Institute of Jethro. Because later on in Moses' ministry, Jethro came to counseling about leadership. So God had used Moses' relationship with Jethro to develop his character, develop his personality, develop his perspective of his calling. And when God saw that Moses had matured and was ready for the assignment, God called out for Moses in a bunny bush and asked him, to go back to Egypt, which doesn't make sense. It's like God asking you to go back to where they were planning to kill you. And you know that they were planning to kill you, but that would be because God has subdued them. Come on, say subdued. God has put them under. He is God. He had touched their hearts. They were not looking for the death of Moses. Imagine, it took 40 years to prepare Moses for a return to Egypt, increasing in the covenant of God, understanding the kairos, the God timing for your appointment. Moses came back to Egypt. Eventually, cut long story short, God used Moses to bring Israel out of Egypt, fulfilling the scripture that says, Israel is my firstborn, out of Egypt have I called my son. Again, faith and obedience. If you will increase in the covenant of God, you need faith and obedience. Hebrews eleven six tells us, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Another covenant we can refer to in the Bible is what Bible scholars call the Davidic covenant. Very interesting what we call the Davidic covenant. Why? Well, because David was considered a favored one. The Bible said, God said, I found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after his heart. Even though David was not perfect, he was a man after God's heart. Meaning to say, God does not major on your perfection when he wants to use you. He perfects you. He doesn't just look for the perfect verses. He perfects his chosen verses. That's how he works. That's how he works. Everyone that God called in the scriptures, I observe at some point, has certain imperfection in their lives. They had something to excuse themselves about. They have reasons to say to God, no, you can't be choosing me. I'm not the appropriate person for this assignment. But when God chooses you, he perfects you. For instance, when he chose us for the salvation, he made room for our perfection. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, 
Bible said he gave gifts unto men for the perfecting of the saints. So God does not call the perfect. He perfects the call. When God has called you, he perfects you. He matures you. He allows you to also grow on the job. Growing on the job is part of increasing in the covenant of God. In the Davidic covenant, God saw in David the son of Jesus a man after his heart. Meaning, for the most part, David aligned with the purpose, the counsel, and the will of God. I said for the most part because there were moments of human frailty in the journey of David. Case in point, when he slept with Bathsheba, Bathsheba, and in a bid to cover up his sin, he killed Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. But look at David's heart. Immediately, Nathan the prophet reprimanded him for what he did in Psalm 51. David repented of his wrongdoing. Why? God perfected his weakness. Listen to me. If God calls you, or if God is calling you as a matter of covenant, and you are looking at your inefficiency or deficiency, God is a good God. Is going to perfect you in the covenant. It's going to improve your life. When God called Saul of Tarsus, he was nothing but good. He was a murderer. He was a killer. There was nothing good. The Bible said Jesus called Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus. And Paul himself says a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ died for sinners, of whom he was a chief. So God does not call the perfect. He perfects the called. However, it is expected of the called to make himself or herself available for God's perfecting process. That's why God improved on Abraham's life. After he called him out of Mesopotamia. You know, in the book of Genesis also, there was a time that Abraham became hesitant, as it were, in certain aspects of his walk with God. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. Meaning, you're not perfect in your walk yet. But it's time for you to be perfected. Walk before me and be that perfect. And when you do, I will make your name great. I will bless you and make you a blessing. A rounding of friends, God wants you to grow in his covenant. God wants you to mature in his covenant. Abraham matured. Even though called, he grew. Moses matured, even though called. He grew. In the Noah covenant, the Bible said Noah found grace with God. He also grew in his obedience. Why? The people of his days criticized him, mocked him, made him feel foolish trying to build an ark when there would be there hasn't been rain for a long time. But Noah insisted. Noah walked with God. The Bible says Noah walk with God. One of the ways to increase in the covenant of God is to walk with God. In the case of Abraham, walk before me. In the case of Noah, Noah walked with God. In the New Testament, God wants us to walk with him. Going back to David, what was the basis of the covenant with the David? Worship. 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 David had a heart of reverence for God. He had the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I mean the reverential fear, not the terrifying fear. Fear that terrifies is of the devil. Fear that reverences is of God. Reverential fear. David had that. When he sinned and he was pointed to his wrong. David referenced the Lord. In Psalm 51, he said, Against you, you only have I sinned. If you mark iniquity, who will stand? 
forgive you, there is forgiveness. If you have made those covenant, just like David, you can outgrow your weakness. We didn't read that David committed adultery or stole somebody's wife again after the saga of Bathsheba and Uriah. He had repented. We didn't read that David killed people unjustly. He had repented. So some people try to hold on to David's wrongdoing and say, well, David did it. No, he wasn't always like that. In the same light, increasing in the covenant of God, God will not have you remain the way you are. He wants to increase you. He wants to grow you. He wants to develop your character, develop your personality. That's how it works. Praise the Lord. Come on, I said, praise the Lord. Now, one good thing about increasing in the covenant of grace is that grace increases you. It was grace that started it. The covenant of grace in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But after we have been saved by grace, grace begins to work in us and through us. He said, for it is God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's the benefit of grace. Grace doesn't just instruct us, he empowers us for obedience. There are two sides to the grace of God, the saving grace and the empowering grace. The saving grace helps us to start the journey of grace. The empowering grace helps us to grow in the journey of grace. Friends, it is an opportunity and a call for us to increase in the covenant of God. And as we increase in this covenant, through our faith, through our obedience, through our worship, and through grace, this covenant will bring increase to our lives, as recorded in the book of Genesis, in the experience of Abraham, and as recorded in Deuteronomy 28, in the experience of Moses and the people of Israel. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you glory. Lord, we choose to follow you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Lord, I receive grace to increase in your covenant and to increase through your covenant, particularly the covenant of grace in Christ Jesus through my faith, through my obedience, through my worship, through my service. I receive grace to work worthy of you. Let it be your prayer this day. I receive grace. Lord, as a community of faith people, we receive grace to work worthy of you unto all pleasing and be fruitful unto every good work. Lord, bless your people with increase. Bless them with increase on every side and cause us to increase in and through your covenant. Thank you, Father. We give you all praise and all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Shalom.